All right, well, this morning we're in Acts 17. We're looking at um, Paul's going to Mars Hill to uh, evangelize, and uh, we'll notice he takes a, a different tact towards Gentiles, particularly Gentile philosophers um, and in the center of Athens where people are talking probably about these things all the time. Paul is seeking to give them reasons to believe in the unknown God and doesn't directly appeal to Scripture. So this is uh, an interesting thing. The truths that he's referring to are coming from Scripture. But he doesn't expect them simply to accept the authority of Scripture, right? He argues for the existence of the true God. And from there, he's going to move to judgment, impending judgment, which we might say they all had some sense of through their conscience, to point them to Jesus, the one who can save them from that judgment. Now, we know that Paul gets cut short a bit here uh, when he begins to talk about the resurrection. He doesn't get to bring the full uh, message, but um, he was at least preparing the ground for it, and some actually did believe. And again, we're not really sure whether this was everything Paul had to say. You know, was, we think about the, the, the sermons of Jesus, you know, the, did, was that everything he said on that occasion? Or did he wax eloquent, so to speak, and uh, give them more of a, of a Hebrews kind of uh, sermon? We don't know, but we do know that we've been given exactly what the Lord wants us to have, and so that's what we're going to look at. So let's begin by reading the text in Acts 17, beginning in verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, <clears throat> what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For I, while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Uh, among whom were also were uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Well, th this is a very large section. We're not going to go through it in a great amount of detail, but hopefully enough to understand what's, uh, what's going on here. And again, the hope is we'll get something of uh, further methodology of how we can approach unbelievers, what we need to do in preparation, 
uh, how we determine where we begin, and what it is we're, we're really seeking to do. And I think it'll kind of help lead us in to what we're going to look at this evening. So may the Lord, again, bless His Word to our hearing this morning. Now, last time we, we left Paul uh, waiting for Silas and Timothy. Remember, once he arrived there, he sent word to, to bring them there while he waited at Athens. Now, Athens is, is basically the capital of Attica, which is another part of modern-day Greece, Macedon and Attica together. And at the time, uh, was the most celebrated city, uh, actually, of the ancient world. A.T. Robertson writes this. Paul is probably here about AD 50. Politically, Athens is no longer of importance when Paul comes, though it is still the university seat of the world with all its rich environments and traditions. Rackham grows eloquent over Paul, the Jew of Tarsus, being in the city of Pericles and Demosthenes, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, Sophocles and Euripides. In its agora, and that's the marketplace, Socrates had taught. Here was the Academy of Plato, the Lyceum of Aristotle, the Porch of Zeno, the Garden of Epicurus. Here men still talked about philosophy, poetry, politics, religion, anything and everything. It was the art center of the world. The Parthenon, the most beautiful of temples, crowned the Acropolis. Now, for the first time in Paul's ministry, it appears that he was by himself. Remember, he was kind of ushered uh, out of the, the last situation he was in in Berea because of the uh, Thessalonians coming and stirring up persecution. And he was in a city that was distinguished for its learning and its wisdom. I mean, people came from all around in order to talk, as it were, philosophy. And yet, in the midst of all this academia, so to speak, he was not intimidated. His heart was still set on that one goal that he set out to accomplish, and that was to glorify his Lord by making him known, no matter what the situation, no matter what the environment, and no matter what the world might think of him. Now, as he walked through the city, as any visitor to Athens would to see the sights, uh, he saw things that obviously provoked his spirit. He experienced a godly jealousy for his Lord as he saw so many idols. Obviously, whenever we see anything that dishonors the Lord, it should grieve us. Now, Xenophon, in his Concerning the Republic of Athens, called the city all altar, all sacrifice, and offering to the gods. A.T. Robertson writes this, Pausanias says that Athens had more images than all the rest of Greece put together. Pliny states that in the time of Nero, Athens had over 30,000 public statues, besides countless private ones in the homes. Petronius, who was a Roman satirist, sneers that it was easier to find a god than a man in Athens. Every gateway or porch had its protecting god. They lined the streets from the seaport and caught the eye at every place of prominence on wall or in the agora. The agora is the marketplace. Now, as Paul saw his Lord dishonored in this way, he was determined that he was going to bring change. And he knew that there was only one way that change is possible, and that is through the gospel. And here's, again, a good reminder that it isn't enough to desire salvation for someone. It isn't enough to pray for salvation, although we need both of those things. We also need to communicate the gospel, communicate truth. If we are to see people come to Christ, if we are to see society change, and that's what Paul, again, set out to do. Now, not surprisingly, Luke tells us he first went to the synagogue. We know that's his way of operation, to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, trying to prove from Scripture that Jesus is the Christ, that he must suffer, he must die, and Jesus is the one who has done this. But he also went to the agora, to the marketplace, to speak whoever, to whomever happened to be there. And Luke tells us on this occasion, he found some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Apparently, these men would frequent the marketplace looking for someone with whom to argue. 
I think we, we know people like that. Uh, we, years ago, we had somebody like that in this church who liked to just sort of hover around every conversation that was going on, wanting to inject himself into it in order to start an argument. Okay, that's not necessarily a good thing. Now, Robertson tells us about these philosophers. He says Zeno, who lived from 360 to 260, I don't know if these dates are correct, that means he lived 100 years, taught in the Stoa, which is the porch. We just heard earlier about the porch of Zeno. And so his teaching was called Stoicism. He taught self-mastery and hardness with an austerity that ministered to pride or suicide in case of failure. A distinctly selfish and unloving view of life and with a pantheistic philosophy, which we understand means that basically God is everything. All matter is God. He is the universe. Epicurus considered practical atheism the true view of the universe and denied a future life and claimed pleasure as the chief thing to be gotten out of life. He did not deny the existence of gods, but regarded them as unconcerned with the life of men. The Stoics called Epicurus an atheist. This low view of life led to sensualism and does today. For both Stoicism and Epicureanism are widely influ influential with people now. Eat and drink for tomorrow we die, they preached. Paul had doubtless become acquainted with both of these philosophies for they were widely prevalent over the world. Now that, that's important to understand what they believed essentially and that Paul understood what they taught because we're going to see him address their beliefs and not just theirs but the rest of the Athenians as well. Now as they listened to Paul, some called him an idle babbler. The word basically means seed picker, like birds in the marketplace that hop around looking for random seeds. Now others, that he was proclaiming strange deities. I want you to notice the word is plural. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, Robertson believes that the Athenians understood what Paul was saying uh, as preaching basically two gods, two that were new and two that were equal, Jesus, and because the Greeks often personified ideas, uh, a female deity called Anastasis. It's a, basically a female uh, gender in the Greek, but the word means resurrection. Now, he's going to correct that, of course. That's why they don't reject him out of hand right away, is because, first of all, they're thinking about he's bringing to our understanding two new gods. By the way, it's interesting to note that Socrates, who was forced to drink hemlock and commit suicide, the charge against him was that he was introducing new gods. So in other words, Paul was doing exactly what Socrates was doing, but things have changed. That happened in 399 BC, and so we might say they advanced a little bit by that time not to be quite so aggressive. Now, wanting to hear more, they took him to the Areopagus that he might explain his ideas more thoroughly. Areopagus literally means the hill of Ares. And as you know, Ares is the Greek god of war. The other name used is Mars. So we hear Mars Hill sometimes, or, we, or Areopagus, which is the hill of Ares. It was a natural amphitheater. It had a flat area where the speaker could stand and a large rock surrounding it on which the people could sit. And we've already been reminded that the Athenians' favorite pastime was to listen to visitors as they came through expressing these new ideas. And of course, Paul was more than willing to share his with them. Now here we get a little bit more insight into how Paul evangelizes the Gentiles. And I think there are close parallels in his methodology of how we should approach unbelievers today. Now, the first thing he does, which is probably his first major argument, was to point to something that everybody shares in common. And it's a sense of dependence. Notice he says in verse 22, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. Now, that is really an argument for God's existence. And by the way, I think it's the same argument that R.C. Sproul is using when he's talking about something exists now 
you know? Therefore, there must be something that exists that started us, right? There's something we depend on. Well, the way this is expressed is through religion, normally, that we are religious by nature, that we all have this sense that we depend on someone else. We know that we did not create ourselves, but we were caused by someone else, by a being, R.C. would argue, that doesn't need a cause, but who simply exists. Otherwise, if that being that, that caused us has a cause, we need to go beyond it, behind him, to see what caused us. Now, it's this sense of dependence that drove the Athenians outside of themselves, basically to worship this whole pantheon of gods so that they would have someone they could look to in times of, of trouble. You know, everybody has their, their fail-safe, their, their sort of safe area where they think, you know, they can run to when they're in trouble. We, we have what's called so-called foxhole conversions that you know, dangerous situations that drive us outside of ourselves. Well, in those days, there were plenty of them. And there were plenty of gods to cover all the different circumstances. And that explains why there were so many idols in the city. So Paul begins with this sense that we all have of dependence. Now, the next thing Paul does is this. He, he finds a point of contact within their culture to make this being known to them. And he found it in an altar to an unknown god. Now, one commentator writes this, the altar of which Paul there speaks as dedicated to an unknown god was probably one of several which bore the same inscription. It is supposed that they originated in the practice of letting loose a flock of sheep and goats in the streets of Athens on the occasion of a plague and of offering them up in sacrifice at the spot where they lay down to the God concerned. So in other words, this is how they determined uh, which God perhaps would save them, and they would sacrifice the animal and then set up an altar. Now, R.C. reminded us, and it may seem maybe that's changed since he did that series, but uh, I don't think it's been that long, that only 5% of Western culture actually claim to be atheists. Okay, the rest believe in some kind of God. Again, this idea of dependence. That means that most of our work in this area, as far as God, will be taken up in correcting false views about God. Okay, so we, we, we notice here that Paul doesn't actually try to prove the existence of God. He, he knows that his, his audience already has that. Okay? Instead, what he's doing is, because they believe in a God, so to speak, he seeks to correct their false views. So he says in verse 23, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Now, I've already mentioned to you that Paul knew what these philosophies taught, and so he sets out now to refute their beliefs and explain the true God. He begins by pointing out that the one who made the world, the cosmos, the universe, and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, being so immense and so powerful, no temple could possibly contain him. And this must be true, since he is the cause of all things. Now, it's believed that he here was addressing the Stoics, who thought of God as a principle of reason that permeates the cosmos, that he is the cosmos itself. Remember this idea of pantheism, that God, God is all. Paul refutes this by saying, no, but he is the one who created the cosmos and so is distinct from it. In other words, God is transcendent. Then he points, notice next, to God's involvement with mankind. Since he made everything, he doesn't need anything from us. He's self-sufficient. He's independent. We need Him. He gives to all people life and breath and all things. Verse 25. He is also sovereign over the world He created. He made from one man every nation on earth, and He planned where and when each would rise and each would fall. Furthermore, we see from the creation that He's good. He has revealed himself through the creation in order that all the nations might seek after him and perhaps find him. 
Paul reminds us in Romans 2 verse 4, his kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. And Paul also reminds them that he is not far from any one of us. He is everywhere. He is omnipresent. Now again, uh, I'm not going into the specifics or the details of this because it would take us far too long, but I'm, I'm looking at methodology. Paul was directing this against the Epicureans, remember, who were practical atheists. Let's just live as though the gods don't exist because they're so far removed and uninvolved with us. Well, Paul is saying, no, God is not far away. He's not uh, removed from us. He's not uninvolved. He's very much involved in everything that's going on in the world. Now, we need to realize that the Epicureans and the Stoics weren't the only ones who were present in this oration of Paul's. Everyone in Athens who was aware of this exchange had undoubtedly gathered also to listen to this because they loved to hear these. They loved to be involved in these things. And I think, you know, when debates are going on on YouTube, you know, and they're, they're put on YouTube, we like to watch those things because we like to hear both sides. So Paul next addresses, I think, issues that are perhaps broader than just these two philosophies. He addresses the three main questions that Greek philosophy was seeking to answer. What causes life? What causes motion? What basically is being, or what, I can't say what causes being, because they knew being was, you know, it simply existed. Well, Paul's answer was God, and that's why he says in verse 28, in him we live and move and exist or have our being. You know, what you're seeking after is all answered in this God I am proclaiming to you. And then finally, he draws on their own writings to prove this. And I think this perhaps is his second main argument. He says, as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Now, one commentator writes this, knowing that the Athenians do not know or respect the Old Testament. Paul quotes from three of their own poets. Although their words originally referred to Zeus, the head of the Greek pantheon, whom Stoics reinterpreted as a personification of reason, Paul applies the quotations to the true and living God of heaven. For we also are his children. So, being then his children, they shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of men. In other words, all these statues are not gods. Now, the Epicureans and the Stoics agreed but the people didn't, as evidenced by their dependence upon all these statues. And I think here Paul's argument is this. He's arguing, which again we've seen R.C. doing, from the effect to the cause. If we are God's children, if, if he is the one who made us, he can't be a lifeless idol. He can't be a statue. He can't be made of gold and silver or stone. He must be more. He must live. He must move. He must have being, or I should say, he must have the power of motion within himself. So again, we are his children. God must be more than these things. And Paul's already argued, well, he's created the universe. Everything has its dependence upon him. Now, finally, he doesn't want to just leave it with defining who God is. He moves to the applicational point, which he wants to bring across, which is because God exists, you're accountable to him, and you're in danger, and you need to repent. So he goes on, having overlooked the times of ignorance, you know, when the nations basically had just the light of general revelation to live by, and they lived in darkness, and they, of course, lived immoral lives. God now declares that all people everywhere should repent because the gospel is being sent out now to the entire world. They need to turn from their idolatry to the living God because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, having proven this by raising him from the dead. Now, a couple of things stand out from what Paul says here. First of all, notice that Paul begins to bring the gospel to bear, first by speaking about judgment, right? Not, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but there is a day that he has appointed in which he's going to judge all mankind. You need to repent, why should you listen to what I'm telling you now? Well, it's because you're in great danger if you don't listen. Secondly, let's notice, he still has not used the Scripture. 
Okay? Now, how is he going to argue that the resurrection is, is real, is true? Well, remember R.C. said the first task is to establish that God exists, you know, and uh, since they already believed that, but had wrong ideas, Paul started by correcting them. But then the second task is to establish the Scripture as the Word of God. Now, Paul doesn't do that on this occasion. So is he not following R.C.'s methodology? Is Paul wrong? No. But think about why he might not have done this. Because if you were going to prove the resurrection, let's say today, what would you do? Well, you first of all have to prove the Bible is the Word of God, wouldn't you? And then you would show it from here. But guess what? The New Testament wasn't written yet. So Paul doesn't have that to prove or to refer to. But what Paul does have is something perhaps even more powerful. He's an eyewitness, isn't he, <laughs> to the resurrection of Christ. And that's why the Lord sent these eyewitnesses out, why he had so many of them, in order to establish the fact that Jesus had rose from the dead before the documents were written that we establish that truth on today. Now, the resurrection not only proves that there is life after death, which means they have something to be concerned about after they die, it proves that Jesus is who he said he was. And so we'll do what Paul says he will do, judge all mankind. Now, this idea of a final judgment was also alien to the Epicureans who believed that the gods could not be concerned, can't be bothered by human affairs, so they weren't looking for a judgment. And the Stoics basically viewed history the way Greeks viewed history in sort of a series of unending cycles. What's happened now has happened before, it's going to happen again, and it just keeps on going and going. They don't see history as coming to a definitive end as, as it being linear, linear. They see it more as a circle of cycles. So when they heard the resurrection, none of them were, were welcoming this idea. They sneered, they mocked, while others said, well, we'll listen to you more on this at another occasion and, and just sort of dismissed him. And that's a way that, I mean, basically the two ways that people respond who aren't going to believe, aren't, don't they? They, they? they mock us or they say, well, well, let's talk about this some other time, okay? Well, Paul then left the amphitheater but thankfully not without seeing some fruit. Some believed and joined him, among whom were Dionysius the Areopagite, who apparently Eusebius tells us, a church historian, he was one of the judges of the court of the Areopagus, who afterward became bishop of the church at Athens and died a martyr's death. Uh, apparently, there was a city council that originally met the Areopagus, and that council had moved, but Dionysius was still attached to that council, and he was saved. That was a very important person. And Damaris, who was an aristocratic woman, and we really don't know anything more about her. But these two, as well as many others, believed. Okay? So, using apologetics, got to get to the crux of the matter. There's a day of judgment coming. I don't know whether Paul was able to complete the message. It seems like he must have because there were some who believed. Um, perhaps they came to Paul to complete it uh, or not, but we do need to get the gospel out. Now, in closing, let me just review what we've seen just in a few steps. When we evangelize, we first need to know what the audience believes. Okay? We need to know God's truth so we can recognize the error when we see the error but we also need to know their belief system so that we will know how to approach them. We should not think that Paul came unarmed and he had not read any philosophy. He addressed the very issues that these philosophies were teaching and sought to refute them. Now, if they don't believe in God, that's where we need to start, using the argument from dependence, you know, a, a first cause. That's what R.C. has been teaching us. Now, if they believe in God but not the true God, then we need to work on correcting their understanding. This God you worship in ignorance, this is the one I proclaim to you. And then next, we need to establish the Bible as His Word. And again, let me just remind you the argument that R.C. gave us. If we just look at the Bible as a reliable historical document, we see that it records several eyewitness testimonies, uh, accounts of what Jesus did. He did miracles. And that proves that he is a prophet sent from God. 
And he is the one who tells us that the Bible, the Scripture, is the Word of God. And once that's established, okay, that's when we might say, okay, we have the standard now. Now we need to get into the standard, and we need to wrestle with the issues of what the Bible actually teaches. That's where we get into the, the matter of uh, you know, hermeneutics, interpretation, and so forth, which is what we often spend most of our time uh, doing. We need to um, prove and explain the gospel from the Word. And let's not miss the uh, other important point we saw here. We need to begin with the danger that people are in. You know, if they don't see their need of a Savior, then they're not going to reach out for a Savior. So, the, um, well, the, the, the law of God and impending judgment is a way that the Lord uses to kind of wake us up. It's why He sent John the Baptist to get the people of God ready. He didn't send them out again with the message, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, Israel. But He said instead, repent and flee from the wrath to come, because if you don't, you're going to be consumed by it, and you need to run to the one who's coming after me because he's the only one who can save you from it. Now tonight we're going to look more at that last point, how once the Bible is established as the standard, we need to be able to use it to lead people to Christ. But again, we need to assess, start from where they are, you know, use the arguments either to establish or to refine uh, the, who God is and then the Bible, and then we need to... to be able to explain the gospel from the Bible. We need to, to be able to use the scriptures to show people their need of Christ, to show them how uh, that they need to come to Him and so forth, what faith is, and what should be true of them once they actually do believe, how they know they really are believers. It's not just because they believe the facts, but it's because their life is being transformed, which is the point of the parable of the talents, the point of uh, what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.10. There's going to be good coming out of our lives if we truly know the Lord. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard, maybe to use it further to equip us. But let's also pray that He would prepare us to come to His table.